Broadcasting from the hills of East Tennessee, you're listening to Justified Radio, where each week we look at one of today's issues through the lens of God's Word. Justified Radio, it's where life meets the Bible. And this is Justified Radio. David, good morning. Good morning, Phil. Good to be with you today, and I'm excited about our talk today. This is going to be fun. It's going to be great, and and more of just a, a discussion today. It's going to turn into, like many of our discussions, something of a series. Yeah, I think so. I think we can make this, I believe we can make this into a very long series. Probably won't, but maybe two or three, maybe four uh, episodes will be devoting to this maybe right we'll not go as deep as could be no well no we we don't have time before the lord comes back for that but no no we really don't <laughs> but but you know when we we play our little intro song there it you know talks about taking an issue of today and looking at it through the lens of god's word and what we're going to start talking about today is an issue today and probably uh one of the most important issues that we as the church that we face i think so because I believe, and I'll go out on a limb here and say what I believe, I believe what we're talking about today is a serious blight on the true church of Jesus Christ today. It is, and it affects the eternal souls of the lost, which which makes it of the utmost priority for all of us. Yeah, it affects the eternity for people. It affects the temporal for people because we believe that a lot of the things going on in the movements we're talking about today are just wrong. Well, and I'm going to say that's right to you're just right, <laughs> but, but it is. And what we're talking about is we're talking about the spreading, the sharing of a false gospel, Yeah, taking and distorting the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And this is this is where there's a fine balance, but it's a balance that needs to be strove for because the fact of the matter is we believe that some of the things being taught in these movements we're talking about day one being the word faith movement of Kenneth Copeland, uh, of Joel Osteen, of that so many. Um, we just believe that a lot of it's wrong. Now, not all of it's wrong. You know, when, if they're pointing you to Jesus, the true Jesus, the biblical Jesus, what they're doing is right. The problem is sometimes they're not doing that. No, they're not. And and the problem with some of these, and we're gonna we're gonna start here in a minute. And you know, always you don't have to read along with us, but you know, we like to reference where we're at in the Bible because we want to be biblical. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, we want to be biblical. Anything we share with you, we want you to open up your Bible and see. Uh, what we're talking about and where we're talking about it. And we're going to use the uh, epistle of the book of Jude as a place to start uh, here. But uh, what we're talking about, this is more than just mere denominationalism. We're not, we're not pointing out denominations as much as, as false beliefs that can spread across denominations and churches, David. Yeah. Yeah. And some people say, well, it's just all about getting people saved. No, it's not. It's really, yes, it's about getting people saved, but it's about making disciples, too, who have a, a, a handle on the true gospel, the true truth, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, that we need to be sharing with people. And the true truth is being sadly missed in some of these things we're going to be talking about in this session and, and a few following. Yeah, we, we have taken, in all, many cases, many have taken uh, what is the gospel that points to Jesus Christ, our relationship with the Lord, and, and rather than making God sovereign in our lives and us serving him, they flipped it, David. And all of a sudden, the relationship between us and God is they would have you believe that God exists to serve us. Right, and that's absolutely diametrically 180 degrees <laughs> Wrong. Right, and so that's that's really that's really what we want to talk about, and so we're going to start. Dave's going to start us in uh, Jude, and you know a lot of times we say the first chapter of Jude, but it's the only chapter. Right, but it Jude. is we'll, we'll we'll look at Jude at the very beginning. Jude, a bond servant, doulos is the word in Greek. It means a slave, and don't be afraid of that. Uh, slave is not a bad word because slave is the indication that God has not only bought us, we belong to him. Right. Where he is. So uh, Jude, a bondservant, a doulos, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Now, Jude suddenly jumps into why he's writing this letter. 
And he says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now that's something, that that's a strong statement. Yes. Because when we say, again, sometimes we say it's all about seeing people saved. Well, Jude wanted to write about that. He wanted to write about the common salvation, the joy in knowing that you're going to heaven, the joy in knowing that your sins are forgiven, the joy in knowing that our Savior, who died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, literally rose from the grave. But the Holy Spirit stopped him. The Holy Spirit said, no, Jude, there's something far more pressing right now that you need to address, and he begins to address that. He says, I want to appeal to you that you contend earnestly for the faith. It's a very strong word. The definite article there is there for purpose. It's saying that this faith is solid, and it's also shared among all who believe. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing today, that's just not true. Well, it, it, it isn't. And, you know, we have to understand, and you, you mentioned, and this is strong. This is, I've, I've got a friend that he had described, he said, oh, this is big. Well, yeah. well, David, this is big. Because Jude really and truly, his desire, his personal desire is to write a word of encouragement to his fellow believers. Yeah. And instead, he ends up, again, led by the Holy Spirit, writing a word of warning. And he points out a, a danger that the church faces. Yep. And... We see danger all around us. And I, I think, me personally, I think we need to be aware of this because many in the church, when we, we look at the dangers, the church that we face as believers, most of the times we're facing outward. We're, we're thinking that, listen, most of our danger, the, the danger that we face comes from outside the church. It comes from, you know, whether it's a political system or this, that, and the other, but, but everything's external. And really what Jude reveals to us is that the danger that we need to guard the most against is coming from within the church. It's inside the walls. Yep. These are the, these are the sheep in wolves' clothing that have infiltrated the church. Listen to what, uh, what Jude says. He follows what we read in verse 3 there by saying this, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. That says a lot, doesn't it? Yep. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. These are, these are very strong statements, very strong accusations that Jude's making against some who are in the church. In the church. Yeah, these are, these are people that are sitting beside you on Sunday, maybe standing in your pulpit. Um, and we've got to be a people who know the gospel, the true gospel, the whole gospel, and nothing but the gospel so that we can understand when something's being presented that's wrong. Well, you know, Paul made this, made this point, you know, uh, when he was going out and preaching, he was uh, comparing, you know, those, to the, those of the Bereans who, when Paul would, would preach and teach to them, they would go and they would, they would search the scriptures to make sure that what he was teaching them, David, was so, that it was solid. Yeah, that's why Christians ought to be going to church on Sunday mornings with their Bible in their hand. They ought to, because what's being said from the pulpit, you ought to have you some pieces of paper that you can put in there where the scripture references are. You ought to have you a notepad where you can take notes. So when you go home, you can go back across these things. You, you don't get everything. The preacher can't preach everything no, in the time and, we have. And this is important because uh, David and I were sitting this morning together, and, and he caught sight of one of our church bulletins. And on the back of our bulletin, we have a space for sermon notes. And I encourage people to make notes there. And I encourage them to bring their Bibles because, you know, oftentimes we'll pick up a verse in the middle of a passage yeah. be because we just don't have the time. And, uh, you know, we'll put it on the screen or something like that. But it is up to the listener, to the individual believer, to make sure that when I pull out a verse and I may summarize what's before and after to give you the context, it's up to you to make sure that I'm telling you what's right. Yeah, you need to make sure that the preacher hadn't just plucked out a, a verse that had nothing to do with what's being said and made it 
a pretext for what he's preaching or saying or believing. And we're going to talk when we look at some of these these distorted beliefs, some of these heresies uh, that are being taught. You're going to see that that the reason that this happens is because they do just that, David. Right. Yeah. That you got to have things in context, biblically speaking. The the one of the things we talk about in this movement is is tongues and the speaking of tongues, the unknown tongues. Well, for one thing, unknown. The word unknown is not in the text. It's an additional word that the translators put in. It simply meant a language that you did not know at the time. But we've changed that into something that was. A language that doesn't exist doesn't exist on earth. A a heavenly language, we'll call it sometimes. Well, the problem is the doctrinal belief system that people have extracted from the Bible to justify them speaking in tongues is taken from 1 Corinthians. The problem with that is 1 Corinthians was a letter of correction Please hear that. We've said this before, but it's something people need to hear. 1 Corinthians especially was written as a letter to correction, uh, to correct a church that was doing everything wrong. This, This is why context is important. Yeah. Because if you go and you lift up a verse, lift out a verse and says, well, the church at Corinth was doing this, they were wrong. Yeah. And... And, you know, you can get on the Internet, and this is why we have to be careful. You can jump on the Internet, and you can just type in a, a search phrase, and, you know, you can you can talk about, you know, the power of God. You type in the power of God, and I guarantee you'll find something that'll say, here, here's 10 verses on the power of God. Here's 25 verses on the power of God. Here's 50 verses on the power of God. And you take and you pluck one of those verses out. And then there are people who will build an entire devotional sermon, whatever, around a single verse without knowing what's in front of it or behind it and whether they're even, you know, interpreting it correctly. Yeah, Rodney Howard Brown, he uses in in some of his uh, revival meetings and church services, he'll grab people by the midsection and scream into their midsection fire, and they're calling for fire to fall down from heaven and all this. Do you really want that? Has he ever read his Bible and really done an extensive survey and study of when fire fell from heaven? I mean, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about the Pentecostal fire, those cloven tongues that that sat down on the head. But you'll notice those were very small fires, indications that something magnificent was going on. When fire fell from heaven, it wasn't a good day. No, it's it it represents judgment. I mean, you know, fire itself represents the presence of God, but but fire when we see it called down from heaven, uh, it is it's, it's judgment. It's not a good thing. Yeah, well, I mean, we think of uh, um, the two Levites, Nadab and Abihu, what they offer strange fire before the Lord, and fire fell from heaven and it consumed them. We we think about uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel talking to the prophets of Baal, and what happens? He calls down fire from heaven, and they're destroyed. Right. I mean, th- this calling down fire from heaven, they really need to understand it's not what they want. No, but it, but but this is this is them taking and, and perverting the Scripture. Now, how do we get there, and what are some of the things we're going to, to look at? Well, you know, as we go through this, we're going to talk about the importance of, of reading and interpreting Scripture correctly. Yeah. Uh, the, the two terms that scholars would use, David, they would talk about uh, exegesis and eisegesis. Uh, they would talk about whether or not we're going to let the, the Scripture lead us into the meaning or whether we're going to, to come up with our own meaning interpretation and then Cherry pick our verses to support what we already think. Yeah, yeah. The the two terms have great meaning. Exegesis is talking about letting your understanding be governed by what is in Scripture, and you get your understanding out of the Scripture. Right. All right. That's that little prefix ek, uh, epsilon key in the Greek, but it it just means out of. You're taking your understanding out of the Bible. Isogesis is a completely different thing. Is, uh, epsilon, iota, sigma, that prefix there means into. Isogetic interpretation is reading into the scripture what you think 
and sometimes even what you want it to say. See, and, and we have to be very careful. Yep. Now, we're talking about heresy. I mean, that's, that's what we're going to be talking about, false teachings. And yet there is a lesson here that we have to be very careful because there are very few of us that if you have any church background at all, that you don't go ahead and carry some baggage with you when you dive into God's Word. Yeah, and that's me and you as well. That's, that's right. All of us. We, 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 what we've been taught, what we've heard preached to us, uh, when I became a pastor, um, I had a whole uh, uh, you know, agenda of preconceived notions of the way that, that I, what I thought the Bible taught, that David, I had to go back and, and learn again because it wasn't enough for me simply to take and propagate what I had been taught without having read it, studied it out, uh, prayed about it, and then coming to my own understanding and belief. And, and for the, the vast majority of everything that I had been taught, listen, I, I affirm that. But it's not enough simply to repeat what you've been told before. Right. Now, we've got to learn these things from others, yes, but under the direction and right. guidance of the Holy Spirit with the Bible in front of us and open, searching the things out in the Scriptures to see whether or not those things that were being taught are true. Um, the Bible's a glorious book, and that's what we've got to get to people's understanding. Mine and yours included, the people we preach to and the people who will listen to us. God wants to talk to you, and he'll do that through the Bible, by his Holy Spirit, and he wants to give you a better understanding of his plan and purpose for your life and for those around you. Right, and and some of the things we're going to be talking about, some of the, the reason we get to these heresies, though, that are being taught is because the Bible has been abandoned. The teaching of the Bible has been abandoned. And we'll talk about those that make the claim, the false claim, by the way, that God still speaks to prophets, individuals that he has chosen, that he is still speaking to them, revealing new truth to them, revealing what's going to happen to the future to them. And, and that is a false claim also. Right, a false claim for prophets, a false claim for apostles. There are still some who say they're apostles in the church now. That they're claiming apostolic authority, right. uh, that it still exists now. And, and based on the Bible, we say, no, there are no more apostles. No. Um, we're here to share the gospel. Uh, the word apostolos means one sent, one, one who goes, and that's what we're to do. But there's a distinction between the apostles who surrounded the Lord in his earthly ministry and us as those who go today. Right. And, and we would make the point also that, depending on how you wanted to define the word prophet, because sometimes prophet can be this, this you know, uh, far-reaching, just someone who speaks for God. But when the Bible talks about the office of prophet, when it talks about the gifts that Christ gave the church, apostles and prophets, uh, I would contend that those prophets don't exist, those that God is speaking through revealing new truth before we had uh, the closed canon of Scripture. Right. Um, now, and whereas I don't think the prophets in the New Testament are like the Old Testament prophets, Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah, Jeremiah and them, I still believe that there's a work the prophets did that we should still be doing, and that's proclaiming the word un unashamedly. Unafraid, with no fear. No, that's what and that's, prophets did. And that's what they did. Is, yeah. But but if you look at the office of a prophet, that there was before they had the New Testament as it was, that God was revealing these these truths through individuals, and and they were speaking authoritatively for God. Right. But God is no longer revealing new unknown truth through human spokespeople here on earth. Right. The way I distinguish it, and this this is just me, mm -hmm. but apostles. They surrounded the Lord. He spoke to him personally. They saw him from his baptism to his resurrection. That's in the Bible, right. Acts chapter 1. You can't debate that. All right. Um, they were the ones who wrote the scriptures that we have. Mm -hmm. The prophets, the New Testament prophets in that first century environment, those were those like Barnabas, Silas, who went out into the world preaching the gospel. They didn't have the New Testament in their hand. But they did have a proper understanding of the Old Testament to be able to proclaim Jesus as Messiah, to challenge the Jews, your Messiah has come, this was him, you murdered him, you c killed him on the cross. This is the Savior of the world. Uh, that's what the prophets then did. I mean, they didn't have the Bible like we have it, right. they did have the Bible. 
But when they went into the synagogue and the synagogue leader, that uh, head elder, that head, head uh, rabbi in the synagogue, when he unrolled those uh, Torah portions and those Tanakh portions and they began to read, these prophets would take that, what they heard, what had been read, and point everybody there to Jesus. Well, they didn't have the Bible. They were preaching the Bible. Right. I mean, that, what the words they were saying is what became right. the Bible. But... So when we, we talk about this gift of prophecy today, those who call themselves a prophet of God, no one is preaching any additions to the Bible today. Better not be. Well, no, but they claim they claim to be. <laughs> yeah. They claim to be be sharing an authoritative word from God that God has personally spoken to them. Right. And so uh, we're going to look at some of the movements. We're going to look at David already mentioned, but we're going to look at the uh, word faith movement, uh, what would also be called the prosperity gospel. Name it and claim it. Believe and receive. Yeah. And we're surrounded by them. And I don't think, I didn't realize it that to the extent until just uh, uh, in the past couple of weeks when I've seen what some of the churches, even around here in our area, what they say when they're taking up an offering. Um, they're teaching things, name it and claim it. I'm, I'm Health and wealth. Uh, health get, and wealth, yeah. yeah I'm, uh, I repent of poverty. I think one of them said. Right? Well, that is that. You know, I came across that, and they're they're re, they're repeating these these readings, if you will, before they take up their tithe and offering. Uh, some of them are word for word coming from from. Uh, you can find them on the website at Bethel Church, and one of their readings begins that I repent of poverty, and and you know just that right there is enough for a a show. Frankly, that's enough for a sermon to think that. That there is those who believe there is a call to repent, to turn away from poverty. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, that's just wrong. So I mean, on every level, that's just wrong. But so, so we're going to look at that—the health and wealth. And, you know, does does God? Is it God's will that all of us that we be the most prosperous around us, and that we be uh, blessed with good health? And can we? The only thing standing between us and realizing those things in our life is us just just stating it and then believing it, and then waiting on it. Right. Yep. Things that need to be talked about. That. We'll look at some of the, uh, the heresies of the charismatic movement, uh, some of the, the different beliefs there. Uh, you know, the movement uh, that is a one Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. uh, those that believe the technical term would be modalism, that do not believe that, uh, you know, the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, uh, exist uh, all at the same time, separately, but all God. Yeah, all one. I mean, we we believe in one God. This is where the Muslim world has real problems with Christianity. They say, "Well, you're you believe in in three gods." No, we don't. We believe in one God right. who presented Himself as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, not like the modalists do. God was the Father. He became the Son, and now He is the Spirit. No, no, that's wrong. That's heresy. That was condemned in the early councils. Sabellianism uh, was the term, if you want to look it up, but um, it's just wrong. It's a heretical belief system that cannot stand up to the scrutiny of Scripture. Right. So we'll look at that. Uh, we'll look at, uh, you know, uh, of the charismatic, some of the things you already mentioned, speaking in tongues, uh, the, uh, the healings, the uh, baptism of the Spirit, some of the things that, that those that are practicing, and these aren't just denominational, are they, David? No, they're not. They're, I mean, they're in Southern Baptist churches and independent Baptist churches and uh, charismatic Catholics now. They're, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. That, that people are practicing these things. And then we'll look at some of the different theologies um, that we see. And, you know, one we see a lot of, David, that I don't think we, we saw before, but uh, uh, we're seeing what we would refer to as a dominion. Uh, theology, yeah. Uh, th this belief or whatever that God has called on us to to go out and to take the world by any means necessary uh, for Him to usher in the return of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now there, I mean, you can and you can find the the term. You look in some of the translations of the Bible. You can find the term dominion attributed to Adam and Eve. They were given dominion over the earth. They mm -hmm. were, uh, but now remember, Adam and Eve messed up. Yes. They introduced sin into the world, and we're all paying the price for that. In Adam and Eve's day, 
and I believe this. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but I, I think about it often. Martin Luther said, Adam would have played with a lion like we play with a puppy. At that time, in that created paradise, that garden, Adam had dominion over the creatures. He named them. They came to him. He enjoyed the, the company of them. Uh, I believe he and Eve enjoyed that for a time until the sin. But when sin came, it affected everything. Yes. It affected the dominion that Adam and Eve had been given over all of creation, not only from the, in the animal kingdom, but also in the vegetation kingdom. Um, things were beginning from that time forward to be plagued with weeds and thorns and thistles. Uh, things weren't growing as easily as they did. Even the care for them was a lot more difficult than it had been. Um, this dominion theology now, it's a very dangerous thing because the Bible clearly makes it evident that things are going to continue to get worse and worse until what we believe the church is removed, mm -hmm. then a seven-year tribulation period, then the return of our Lord to set up a thousand-year millennial reign here on, on earth. We'll get to be a part of that. Right. And, and, and this is, this is what we're talking about. The difference though, is because there are amongst Christians, David, there are doctrinal differences. There are those. Now we talk about a rapture of the church and there are those who, who do not believe in a literal rapture and they're going to hell, aren't they? Nah. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he's, not. he's joking by I the way. Yeah. He, no, he is. But, but this is what we do. We have to be careful that we can disagree about whether there's going to be a rapture or not. There are those who believe in a rapture that they disagree of the timing, mm -hmm. disagree about whether or not the tribulation is literal, disagree about the millennial rule of, of uh, Christ here on earth. And so there are times that we as believers that we disagree with one another, but we wouldn't say that we approach them like Jude is calling for us to approach these, these heretics, that we're not contending against false teachers because we do share a common salvation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's the same for a Methodist, for a Baptist, for a Presbyterian, for a Catholic, for, uh, for a charismatic. Right. I mean, let's not miss that. No, no, no. Um, but, but we're it, talking about a heresy. What Jude describes as, as two things. I mean, he mentions two things. First of all, first of all, we're talking about teachings that, uh, distort God's grace and takes God's grace and uses that grace as an excuse to live immoral lives. And the other is, and he says right here, is also that denies Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Yeah, I mean, he even punctuates it by saying our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus weren't divine, that's a blasphemous statement, isn't it? Well, well, right. And so when we look at these, and we're going to try to bring in some some tapes, some recordings too, but, but when you look and you hear someone who denies that Christ is the only begotten Son of God, right. or someone who denies the deity of Christ, that, that Jesus only became the Christ at the baptism. Well, at, the baptism. Yeah. at his baptism, I mean. Right, but... And that that we that we will be the same as Christ. That Christ is just the 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 first of many to come. That we equate ourselves with Jesus Christ. When we start doing those things, when when we refer to ourselves as as little gods, as gods also, right. or you know, we start praying. I, I this has been some years, but one of the prosperity preachers uh, made the statement that, you know, when they pray, they quit praying in, in Jesus's name because listen, they just pray in their own name Yeah, because they equated themselves as having the same position as Christ. Yeah. Paula White, who was one of, and I'm a, I was a Donald Trump fan. I don't, I don't even hide from that. I, I think he could have been a better president. Yeah. I've never seen a president yet that I didn't think could have been a better president. Right. But bottom line is Paula White was one of his spiritual advisors. I saw on on a on an interview, Paula White sitting with another preacher said, "No, Jesus is not the only begotten of the Father. We're all begotten of the Father. That's wrong. I mean, that's that's absolutely wrong. Am I a son of God? Absolutely. On the level of Jesus, no, no way. No, Jesus is the begotten of, of only begotten. The only begotten. We're children of God by adoption. 
Yeah, by adoption, <laughs> naturally born, by the way. Begotten has a whole connotation to it. What Jesus came, How Jesus came into this world was supernaturally mm-hmm. done through the womb of a virgin with no human intervention, begotten of the Father in heaven. Right. Though he coexisted with the Father. Makes that clear. Read the the prayer in John 17. Oh, see, now we're going to get into to the uh, humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ, yeah. and, and we can't comprehend it, and yet the Bible teaches Very it. Very clearly, yeah. And so uh, so we're talking, we're going to be talking just her- heresy, false yeah. beliefs that could slip into any church at any place in any denomination. And not only in any church, in any person. If we're not careful. If you're not careful, because there's a, you know, the, the, one of the problems in this new age of being able to see things all the time on the internet and everything, yeah, you go to church, you go to a good Bible believing church, you're listening to a good preacher who stays in the scriptures, believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, teaches the grace of God, but the responsibility of humanity. And by the way, I tie the two together. Uh, Some say, well, you're an Armenian. I don't care what you call me. You have responsibility. God does all the work in salvation. It's by his grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. But you still have responsibility, yes. okay? We can't hide from that. So people that believe that and have heard that, they can still listen to somebody who's teaching something contrary. And I'm telling you, they'll make it sound good. No, and they do. And and this is what we see a lot of times. And, and this is what even as pastors that we're questioned about sometimes yeah. are, are people that, that, you know, the listeners, they don't even know, but they said they've gotten a word from God mm-hmm. or that this is what Scripture means. And listen, it's attractive to say that God wants you to be wealthy and God wants you to be healthy, especially for those who either have a lot or have little. Because people who are rich, listen, they want to think that God is affirming their riches, yeah. that, that they're righteous and God's showing that. And those that are poor, David, that they're very susceptible to, to some of these false teachings because they're so poor, they want to have money. They want to be rich. Well, nobody wants to be poor. No. no. I mean, that's just a fact. I don't want to be poor. But, and this isn't in Sunday school talk either. I don't care if you don't have $10 in your bank account. If you have Jesus, you're rich. Right. Now, that's a fact. But I heard one of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospels uh, preachers say Jesus was a rich man. That's very contrary to what the Bible presents Jesus as being. He didn't even have anywhere to lay his head. Right. And so this is why we're talking about heresy. And this is what, on upcoming uh, editions of Justified Radio, these are some of the things we're going to be addressing, and we want you to join us for it. And if you have any questions... You can always reach out to us by our email, david at justifiedradio.org, phil at justifiedradio.org, or you can go to our website, justifiedradio.org, and there is a form on there. You can fill and send us any feedback, any questions you might have. Yeah, come back and be with us, because I think this is going to be good. Yeah. So until the next time, David says, Shalom. God bless. You've been listening to Justified Radio, where life meets the Bible. You can find us on the web at justifiedradio.org, where you can submit questions, subscribe to our podcast, and find links to our social media. That's justifiedradio.org. Until next time, thanks for listening.